Good morning, Collective. How are you guys doing this morning? Yeah. Hey, uh, my name's Curtis, and I'm excited to get to be here again with you guys today. Uh, a couple weeks ago, Michael kicked off this series on Proverbs, uh, where we're looking at uh, like why it's such a good book for us to just go and read. And there's so many good practical things that we can glean from the wisdom in Proverbs. So every week we're looking at a pro tip, and the second week of this series, Michael, your lead minister, he spoke to you about the power and the weight of your words. Uh, And in that message, he told you a little bit about his college days, and he mentioned a time where he had gotten in trouble and had to go see the president and the dean of students. Now, Michael likes to leave a lot of details out and stories like these, uh, and uh, I'm here today as his, uh, I'm his self-appointed best friend and brother, and he's in Israel and can't stop me, so I want to tell you a little bit more about what happened to lead up to that event. You see, we, as a bunch of freshmen in college, we had pulled a series of pranks that frankly didn't end the way that we thought that they would. And one of those pranks uh, actually didn't start out as a prank at all. One of those pranks actually just started as us taking a midnight swim at the school's pool. And so the way we thought we would do this is, I don't know, like there were plenty of other places we could go swim, but we were like, we want to break into the school gymnasium and go for a swim. So we had our buddy, Josh, hide up in the bleachers and wait for the security guards to come through and shut everything down. And once they shut everything down, then he would come and he would let us in the door and we would go for a swim at midnight. It's like college. Like now that sounds awful. But at the time, we're like, this will be amazing. And so while we were waiting, while we were waiting for Josh to come and let us back in after security shuts everything down, three of us decided to run to Walmart which is pretty sure, uh, I'm sure that that's where all good ideas go to become bad at midnight. We're inside of Walmart, and Michael has the idea to go for the holy grail of pranks and says, let's dye the pool red. So the three of us that were there, we were like, what could go wrong? This is a great idea. Let's go to the juice section, and we bought Every single piece of red Kool-Aid that they had to offer, we spent almost $300 on Kool-Aid, which, side note, it's pretty amazing that you could buy $300 worth of Kool-Aid at your local Walmart at midnight. And we show back up at the pool, and midnight has passed, or whenever it was that they shut it down, Josh comes, and he goes to let us into the gym, and we let him in on how this idea has developed over the last several hours. And immediately, Josh says, this is not a good idea, guys. I don't like it. Let's not do it. I don't think that this will end well. To which, at this point in time, because this idea has been marinating for a couple hours, we tell him, get aside, party pooper. We have a pool to die. We go in and we swim, and the swimming, the fun of that lasts maybe 30 minutes. And we're like, okay, it's time for us to dye the pool red. It had grown to now there was 10 of us. 10 of us gather around the outside of the pool, Kool-Aid in hand, and we count down. Three, two, one, Kool-Aid! It didn't take very long for the entire room to smell like a chlorine version of Fruity Tootie Blast. And it was that moment that hit me, and for the first time I thought, maybe this wasn't a good idea. But by then it didn't matter, we jumped in the pool, we're swimming around, we're having a blast. The fun lasts about an hour. The legend of that event grew for about a day, and three days later we were sitting in the president's office facing some pretty serious repercussions because the pool was red, Uh, students were out of work study, we had stained the lining of the pool, and they were claiming that we busted some huge sand filter, and now we're facing a hefty fine to fix this. And we're sitting in the office, and we're all grumbling amongst ourselves, and we're saying, how did we get caught? Where did this go wrong? Why are we here? To which Josh chimed in, I told you this was a bad idea. I told you that this won't end well. Everybody loves a friend like that, right? So that brings us to our pro tip for today. And in this series, we're looking in Proverbs, gleaning wisdom written by a guy named Solomon, who the Bible describes as the wisest man to ever live. 
And so today, our pro tip I want to share with you this morning, it talks about two types of people. It talks about two types of people in one set of circumstances. And of those one set of circumstances, they show you two different responses. And because of those two different responses, two very different outcomes. And I want you to memorize this. I have worked on memorizing this. I'm working on getting my children to memorize this verse because it's just that practical. Whether you love and follow Jesus or not, you will agree with our pro tip this morning. Proverbs 22.3 says this, a prudent person foresees danger and takes precaution. Now, Prudence, not a word that we use too terribly often anymore. In fact, like initially, we're kind of like, whoa, prudent, you know, but a prudent, like it's wise, right? It's, it's someone who is sensible, someone who takes heed to wisdom, right? This is who we want to be. Like you would want to be a wise, successful person. This is, you would want to be person number one in this pro tip because it says the prudent person sees danger, right? You foresee danger. You see danger coming, and you take precaution. And, and, and the word that's originally translated there, like in, in, in the original Hebrew text, it's actually like a, a military term for a scout who a commanding officer would send out the scout ahead of his army, and they would go, and they would see what's out there, and then they would report back to the commanding officer so that the commanding officer could either tell the army to take a defensive position to get ready, danger's coming, or they could totally change course and avoid the danger. The prudent person, a wise person, a sensible person, foresees danger and takes precaution. But then it goes on, and the rest says, but the simpleton, which is just kind of fun to bring that back into the 21st century, right? The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. A simpleton. Now, a simpleton, it's someone who's naive, right? Someone, someone easily taken advantage of. Some older translations of this word actually use the word foolish or stupid. None of us want to be this guy, Right? None of us are sitting around and thinking, you know what, I hope they put on my tombstone one day. Here lies Curtis Teal. Man, was he stupid. Right? Like you're, not, you're not thinking that. Here lies Curtis Teal. Boy, was he easily taken advantage of. Like you're, you're not thinking that. That's not who you want to be. You don't want to be the simpleton. It says that the simpleton goes blindly on just keeps going. And because of that, they suffer the consequences. Yeah, maybe they see the danger out there. Maybe somebody warns it of it, but they just keep going. And because they just keep going, they just keep suffering the consequences. And this isn't a new thing for us. This isn't something like earth shattering, like, oh, I never knew. This is an issue that we have struggled with for our entire human existence. And so to help highlight what we're talking about this morning, I want to look at a story out of 1 Samuel. Now, 1 Samuel is in the first part of our Bibles called the Old Testament. And the Old Testament follows a group of people known as the Israelites. And when Israel first became a nation, they had been rescued out of slavery to the Egyptians by God and so therefore, to like start governing their group of people, they set up what we would call a theocracy. And the idea that God calls the shots, and in this case, God calls the shots through a prophet named Samuel, hence why the book is named Samuel. And God would call the shots through Samuel, and Samuel would tell the people, hey, this is what we need to go and do. And Samuel does some really cool things in the first couple chapters of the book, but as we all do, Samuel gets old, and as Samuel gets old, he's got to start thinking about his succession plan, and this is what happens in 1 Samuel 8, starting in verse 1. It says this, as Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges over Israel. Joel and Abijah, his oldest sons, held court in Beersheba, just another city, but they were not like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes, and they perverted justice. 
Now, it's not out of the ordinary here for Samuel to go and appoint his sons to be the next leaders of Israel. That would be expected. It was, it was customary. The catch is Samuel's sons are not like Samuel. Samuel's sons are not godly. Right? Instead of listening to God and implementing and leading with what God said, Samuel's sons would, would do what would lead to them having more wealth and more power. And I know that's probably a stretch for you to imagine a world where that happens, right? Someone using a position of power in order to gain uh, for their own personal gain. But just try to imagine with me this morning a world where that happens. Verse 4, the story continues. It says this, Finally, the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Now, in this case, the elders in the village would have been older, wiser, in most cases, guys, leaders from different villages who would be able to come and highlight something that they found concerning, right? They'd be able to voice concern over things they found concerning. And in this case, they found it concerning that Samuel's sons were not like him. And so they go to Samuel and they say, hey, look, this is a Samuel, this is a perfect opportunity, right? You're getting old, you're going to pass away, and your sons are going to take power. They're not godly like you. This would be a perfect opportunity. Appoint for us a king. And the issue is, is they're not trusting God here in this moment. And so they bring this idea to Samuel. They say, hey, like, we don't trust God for kind of what's next, and so we want to take it into our, our own hands. Why don't you appoint for us a king and notice what they say because we want to be like everyone else. We want to be like all the other nations around us. Well, this idea doesn't sit well with Samuel. And Samuel does what we should do when we're facing something and it's just not sitting quite right. Samuel goes and he talks to God about it. Samuel goes and he essentially prays to God and he talks to God about it in verses 6 through 9. And I'm just kind of, kind of summarize it for you. He goes, hey God, they came to me and, and, and they're not trusting you. God, they're not seeing you as their king. They're not seeing that you're the one that provides for them, that you're the one that provides safety. You're the one that provide and care for them. And what they're, they're asking me to now go and appoint for them a king. What do you want me to do? And so Samuel talks to God about this. There's this really small, cool verse where God speaks back to him and and he says, look, Samuel, it's not you they're rejecting. They're rejecting me. They're rejecting God. They're rejecting me. So do what they want. Give them a king. But when you anoint for them a king, before you do that, make sure you warn them. Warn them solemnly what having a king is going to lead to, warn them of what they're signing up for. And so Samuel goes back to the people and he lists out for them the negative things that are going to come along with having a king. And this happens in verses 10 through 17. Samuel goes and he says, hey, look, I recognize like you, you think a king is the easy answer to your problems, but, but if you play this decision out for a little bit, think about how this is going to play out. A king... Is going to take your sons. He's going to take your best sons and run your best sons in front of his chariots to fight his battle while he's back, relaxing, safe, hiding away. He's not going to take your sons, but he's going to take your daughters. He's going to take your daughters to be beauticians and cooks and bakers for him and his family. He's going to take your best fields, your best vineyards, And he's going to give those things to the people that he wants to give them to. He's going to tax you to pay for all this stuff. He's going to take your best cattle, your best sheep, your best everything. And Samuel ends his warning with you guys like, you were already rescued out of slavery. He's going to take all the best stuff and then to top it all off, you yourselves will be his slaves. He says, guys, I get you want a king. But this isn't going to give you what you think it's going to give you. 
And I love how he ends his warning in verse 18. Samuel's ending his warning and he's, he lists out all those things that are going to happen. He's going to take your best sons and you're going to get tired of it and you yourselves will become his slaves. And then it says, when that day comes, you will beg for relief from this king you are demanding. But then the Lord will not help you. In other words, you think the king is the answer to your problems. But this will not play out well. And when that happens, the king is here to stay. And with all that said, the elders respond. The people respond in verse 19. But the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still want a king. Even so, we still want a king, they said. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us. And lead us in to battle. See, the people don't pay attention to Samuel's warning. They hear all the bad things, but it's not enough to deter them. And so God, because he's a gracious and merciful God, gives them exactly what he wants, what they want, a king. Samuel, in the next couple of chapters, he goes and he appoints for a king a man named Saul, a, a person, a king that the people chose. And it plays out well for the nation of Israel for about one maybe two chapters, and then things start to go downhill. And over the next several generations, it's a little bit of up and a whole lot of down for the kings in Israel. In fact, eventually, a man named Rehoboam becomes a king, king number four, so that's as far as they make it, king number four. And because of Rehoboam's extremely heavy taxes, and his ego, which is exactly what Samuel warned of, the nation of Israel rebels against him, rips the nation into two, and now families are fighting against each other in a civil war. And I have to imagine that if Samuel was around, he said, how did you not see this coming? I told you that this wouldn't end well. I tried to tell you. Something that they think is so good, an answer to all their prayers, turned out exactly how God, through Samuel, said it would. Proverbs 22, 3. A prudent person foresees danger and takes precaution. The simpleton keeps going and just suffers the consequences. Didn't you see this coming? Just like Josh had said to us, that morning sitting in the office. And that made me realize something. And that's, we're not immune to this. Right? We're not immune to this. And so often, right, when things are happening, yeah, like, yeah, 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 I know it played out this way with him. I know it played out that way with her. I know, I've been, like, I've seen it. Well, my story's different. But it's, but it's different this time around. But the catch is, is our story never really is that much different, is it? it almost always plays out the same way. And my guess is that you, you've personally experienced a situation like this where maybe you were the person trying to be wise to a close friend, someone that you love, right? Let's just, for a moment this morning, let's just, let's just talk about other people for a little bit because that's just a little less self-incriminating and a little bit easier to digest. Right? Like you've had somebody where you've talked to others and you've tried to warn them. Like you've tried to warn someone you love. You don't want to keep doing this. You, you don't want to keep lying like that. You don't want to keep avoiding that thing. You don't want to keep keeping that secret. Right? If you do A, you can sure as heck expect B. And you try and talk to them, and you sit back, and they keep going on with it, and sure enough, they keep doing A, B happens, and they're sitting there dumbfounded, like, ah, uh, and you're like, ah, uh. like I saw it coming. And to you, it's so obvious, because you saw it a mile down the road, but they just kept going. And you want to say, I tried to tell you, I tried to say, how did you not See this coming. And so there's two things I want you to see from this story in 1 Samuel and our pro tip 
for today. And the first is, and we know this, right? It's not going to be a shock. But when you are making decisions, there is a point of no return. There is a point of no return. Um, I am an adventure guy. I love taking adventures. I am loving that as my kids are getting older, I'm getting to take them on adventures with me. Hikes, uh, zip line, I mean, you just name it, I'm in. You don't have to do much convincing to get me to, to jump into it. And uh, my kids are following in those footsteps. And so I'm excited to one day get to take them whitewater rafting. And when you go whitewater rafting, I would advise to always go with a guide, someone who has been there before. But the crazy thing is, in most state parks and rivers and so on, you don't need a guide to go with you. If you have a kayak, a canoe, or some other raft, if you want to, you can just hop in and start taking on the river, just going for it. And because of that, right, in real serious rivers, from time to time, you'll see a cable stretched from one side of the river to the other or on the sides, a sign posted like this. Says something to the effect of danger, rapids ahead, attention. You're trying to get you to pay attention to the fact that, hey, something's not too far off here, and if you're not ready for it, you're going to have to be. And the thing is, is you have to decide in that moment whether or not you're going to get out of the river, walk your canoe around, and then get back in on the other side of whatever the danger is, or... Are you going to stay in and ride this thing out? And you know what the interesting to me part is, is you know where those signs are not posted? At the beginning of the rapids. And you know why? Because you're already going, oh crap, I should have got out, I should have got out, I should have got out, I should have got out. Actually, if we're being honest, what's really going on in your mind is, ah! can't really think in those moments, but the translation of that yelling is, I should have got out. I should have went for it. I, I shouldn't have stayed in the river. I should have changed course. But you know what? You can't. And you're about to be an experienced rafter because you can't get out. It's too late, buddy. You are in it. The consequences are playing out. And there's nothing you can do about it except hold on and scream for mercy. See, around this curve, in this sign, like you're looking right now, danger, rapids ahead, there are no warning signs except the warning sign. Everything looks good. It seems good. It feels good. But someone's saying, man, I don't like this. And you have to choose. Will I get out or will I ride this thing out? Right? And this is true in our own lives as well. Right? Three, two, one, Kool Aid is not the time to think maybe this isn't a good idea. It is too late. That Kool Aid is in the pool. Right? Just like five maxed out credit cards. Two car loans, a mortgage, and a short-term loan is not the time to think, maybe I should make a budget. Seeing your adult children act out the anger that you have acted out on them to their siblings is not the time to think, maybe I should do something about this. Pregnant is not the time to assess, maybe we shouldn't be sleeping together in this relationship. Once you have stepped across that line and you are actually in the affair is not the time to think, maybe I shouldn't send this message. Right? Once you have actually cheated on that test is not the time to wonder whether or not this is a good decision. See, in those moments where we have passed that point we know we have already made it so much more difficult on ourselves. And most often, there is not, we are not left with a whole lot of easy and good options. 
And I know this part of the message isn't super encouraging, but I'm, I'm hoping that stressing the importance of this might help us to take a moment and say, wait a minute. I'm hoping that maybe it could help us see I need to change course. It's time for me to maybe make some corrections. And this is why the second thing that I want us to see this morning is so incredibly important. This is why I love Jesus, because I have good news. God still uses this story in 1 Samuel for good to come. Because no return does not mean no forgiveness with Jesus. Just because you pass a point of no return does not mean no forgiveness. You see, in this story in 1 Samuel, Saul, the king that gets appointed, kind of quickly falls out of being a good godly king. And God uses this moment to establish the next king, a guy named King David, who the Bible describes a man after God's own heart. And through David's lineage, we actually end up getting Jesus, which is the only reason that any of us who have ever stepped across that line, that point of no return, have any hope of ever beginning to put our life back together. The best place for you to start this morning with that is to begin to let Jesus call the shots in your life. Right, to say, you know what, Jesus, I've, I've done my own thing. I've listened to my own wisdom. But I'm going to start listening to your wisdom now. And if that's you this morning, if you're ready to say, you know what, I'm ready to start letting Jesus call the shots in my life. One of the first things that Jesus asks us to do is to be baptized, to be dunked in water, to say, you know what, I'm not living my way anymore. I'm going to let Jesus call the shots in my life. If that's you, I want you to mark on your digital connect card that you're interested in baptism. And someone from our team will follow up this week. And so here's what I want you to walk away with what we're talking about this morning from our story this morning. And that is don't keep compounding bad decisions. If you've gone too far, the consequences are already playing out. And you know that. You feel the weight of that. C.T. Christian Thompson said last week that we are ridiculously in control of our lives. You will decide what you do when you walk out of here today. Don't keep compounding bad decisions on something you already regret. Decide to go to work on your marriage now. Talk to a financial advisor and make a budget and be disciplined to stick to it. Stop dating the guy that you think you can fix. Stop dating the girl that you think you can fix or that you think can fix you. Stop looking for immediate happiness. Stop looking for immediate happiness in the hookup and start dating, start dating for something meaningful instead of just pleasurable. Go to counseling. Stop taking your phone with you to your bedroom or your bathroom at night where you know you're looking at things and doing things you shouldn't be. Don't keep alcohol in the house. Stop lying because you don't want to be the simpleton. I know that. Because the prudent see danger and take precaution. But the simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. What I want to challenge you to do this morning, uh, as I was challenged by someone I really look up to, to turn this proverb into a prayer. And so for a long time in my life, I've been praying this as, as a prayer. I want to encourage you to take your phones out, take a picture of this, this prayer, and just, just start with this week. Just start with today and begin to pray this prayer in your life. God Help me see danger while well, it's a long way off. Help me see danger a long way off. Give me the wisdom to know what to do. And then I, I, I personally think this is the most important part of the prayer. Give me the wisdom to know what to do and the guts to do it. And you know why? Because let's be honest, right? Most of the time, knowledge isn't our problem. 
right? Knowledge isn't our problem. So we don't have the courage to do it. So God, would you help me see danger coming from a long way off? Give me the wisdom to know what to do and then the guts to do it. Not too terribly long ago, I had been praying a version of this prayer and it was just kind of in the back of my mind. I wasn't necessarily seeing how it was playing out in my everyday life. And we were cleaning up, my wife and I with our four kids, we were cleaning up after dinner and my oldest, Hadley, got in our middle child, KJ's face. And I don't know what they were upset about, but she's, her face gets real red, her body got all tensed up, and she got in KJ's face, and she said, what is wrong with you? And I was like, wow, that's, hmm. And I kind of like stopped everything and looked at Abby and told Hadley. We kind of de-escalated the situation, sent Hadley into the other room, and it was just my wife and I. I said to my wife, Abby, and I said, wow, what's gotten into KJ? And then my wonderful wife said those words that we all love to hear as a parent from our significant other. She looked back at me and she said, that's you. I I was like, oh, come on. It's a little much, isn't it? You know, I think you're maybe overplaying things just a tad. Just kind of left it at that. And a little bit goes by. And some of you foresee danger and know where this story is headed. I had a stressful day at work. I'd come home and Hadley did something to send me over the edge my body tensed up, my face got red, my finger came out, and I got in her face and I said, what is wrong? Oh. Yeah, okay. I had this like out-of-body experience of like, hmm. And it was that moment that I decided, I need to deal with this. And I started going to counseling. Quick side note. Uh, This is just extra. Sometimes you need to be the good, godly friend to say something. Right? A couple weeks ago, Michael in his sermon on words gave us the wisdom of keeping our mouth shut. And there is wisdom in that. But when you are the close, good, godly friend, and it's someone you love making unwise, destructive decisions, you need to be the good, godly friend. And even though it's going to be painful, and even though it's going to be difficult, you need to be brave enough to say it anyway, because someone you love is heading towards danger. And you don't want to see them suffer the consequences. You want to go to them face to face and say it anyway. And for me... Luckily, it stuck out, and I said, I don't want to head us towards danger. And I don't know what it means. I still definitely don't get it all right, but I recognize it a lot earlier now, and I'm doing better. And I don't know what it means for you, but I hope maybe in some way this encourages you to start listening and to maybe change out of a path that you know is leading you to danger. Samuel tried to help the Israelites see trouble coming while it was still a long way off, but they just kept going. And because of that, they suffered the consequences. And I know you do not want to be the simpleton. Let's pray. God, we love you. Um, God, thank you for loving us. God, thank you for your son. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for mercy. God, thank you for grace. God, thank you for endless second chances. God, thank you that just because a point of no return happens, it does not mean that there is no forgiveness. God, would you help us see danger coming while it is a long way off? Would you give us the wisdom to know what to do? And then, God, in those moments, in those quiet moments where we have to make a decision, God, would you give us the guts and the courage to do it so that we would not just go on blindly and suffer the consequences? We love you and we thank you. It's in your son's holy and awesome name we pray. Amen.